Okay, today's going to be really interesting as we tackle an age-old theological question of predestination versus free choice. I'm going to give a crack at it. Uh, before that, though, a couple of housekeeping items. We are going to move on from family night for now. We feel like it's a good decision and that it's been a good run. It's been a good experience, um, but especially as we are all super scheduled and super busy in our lives, especially for adults, um, we are going to hit the pause button on family night for now. So we have some other things uh, we're going to do instead um, as far as pr um, providing meals and b just being able to eat together and stuff like that. Also, family camp, uh, we ran into some pretty serious snags as far as the cost of it. And Families, it was looking like it was going to be over $1,000 for just a few days, and uh, we were going to be sharing the camp, and it just didn't seem like a good value no matter how we spun it. So we're going to push family camp a year. There's not going to be family camp this summer, and so we, are, we think it would be fun. We just need to find a good way to make it work, and so we made those two uh, decisions, and I wanted to let you know about those. Okay, so we are in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians talks about predestination. You'll find a great debate in church history that's always been around between God's sovereignty and man's free choice. And you've got your Calvinists. What are the Calvinists? Who are the Calvinists? They believe, Nate, I know you know the right answer and you're not raising your hand, but this is your last Sunday for a while. You want to sit up front? Get up here. Oh, he should sit up front. Emily. Who are the Calvinists, Nate? John Piper. John Piper. Okay, thank you, Aaron. That's a good answer. Once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved. Predestination. Predestination. So this is the camp that's believing like God kind of decides it all for us kind of thing. We can't even choose him without him choosing him for us. And then you've got, hopefully I'm saying this camp right, the Arminians, and they believe what? Free will. Free will. So totally free, God won't get in your way, choose as you wish. i am probably fall more in that camp if I had to choose one personally. You can change God's mind with prayer, etc. And so you've had these two camps and they've been kind of battling it out and people will fall in different, one camp or another. And the question is, how can, how can you have both? Like, how can you have predestination and free choice at the same time? Surely only, surely only you, can, you can only have one and kind of pick which one you want. So uh, here's my disclaimer. I've said before, I'm not a theologian. I, I didn't go to Bible school. I haven't sat in, I mean, people go to class after class on this stuff. Hundreds of pages written by commentators, and et cetera, et cetera. Hours and hours, pages and pages, decades, centuries of debate. So I'm going to tell you what I think about it and just kind of let it simmer in your heart and your soul and your spirit from there. How's that sound? I want to start with a question. Let's see if I can click to my question. Okay, well, there's my question. Let's hang on that for a second. How do you go about knowing someone? How, how do you recognize, perceive, and determine that they will be a good friend? Facebook. Facebook. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> wow, good one. T technology to help us out. Trust? How do you know if you can trust them, though? Time. Time. Okay. Have a lot of talking, that goes on. talking that goes on. Guys might need to shoot animals together. Women need to talk. Okay, yep. First impression. First impression. Common values. Common values. Observation. Observation. Support. Support. Love all this participation today. Hair length. Hair length. Beard. Oh, beard length. Wow. Nice. That's good, that's good. What does a long beard mean versus a short beard? It means you're awesome. 
means you're awesome. Yeah. Which one? They're both good. Oh. Brad, you have a very nice beard. We've seen your beard. We know you, and we love you. I'm feeling discriminated. Oh, no beard. Yeah. Spiritual discernment. Common interest. Can you know someone without any of that stuff? What if they were a blank person and you literally wrote in all that stuff for them? Would you feel like you knew him then? Just humor me, Deb, for a second. Let's say they're a, a person with no personality. You can decide whatever personality you want them to have. You can decide however long beard you want them to have. You can decide all their interests and everything like that for them. And you wrote it all in, their beard length, their personality, what restaurants they liked. You did it all for them, and then it was done, and then you looked at them and you said, ha ha, here they are. Would you feel like you know them? That would be a robot. A robot. Okay, okay. It's just a question, guys. Relax. Okay. Um, here are the verses I want to travel through. I'm going to see if I can go backwards. Now, clicker. Uh, we haven't gone very far through the book of Ephesians, but this is, these are the verses I do hope to cover here today. Ephesians 4, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 4 through 18. We're going to read them, and then we're going to look at an illustration, and then we're going to look at them one more time. Let's dive in. This is chapter 1, verse 4. I'm reading out of the New American Standard uh, Bible. And follow along with me. Just as he chose us in him, so the Father's choosing us in him, being Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us. In the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things upon the earth in him. Also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth of the gospel of your salvation, Having also believed, you are sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you, while making mention of you in my prayers." that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Comma. We're going to stop, stop there. Okay, so when I was a high school teacher and... Um, especially in the upper sciences, in physics and chemistry, anytime there was a complex situation that had to be explained, I created a drawing and a graphic and a diagram. So I have created a drawing and a diagram of these verses. I know you're so excited. Thank you for the, the yay. I'm going to explain what you're looking at because I want to use it to explain stuff. Let's see if I can go back. I know it's up on the screen. Uh, 
Okay, so here we have two main vertical lines. This one here, this is the line that's labeled foundation of the world. So anything on the left of that line is the stuff that happened before God made the world, the universe, etc., etc. Over here we have the end of time, as it were. This is where you and I would die, the death of our body. And in between here you have your journey through earth. And the reason why I want to draw uh, something to illustrate is because there is a pretty big difference between us and God, and that is that he isn't bound by time, and we are. So you'll notice, I drew him in purple. This is how I always draw. God's always bigger than Jesus in my drawings. So I was wearing this V-neck situation. So here's the Father, here's Jesus. You'll notice uh, the winged one is the Holy Spirit. Here's the Father again, Holy Spirit, and here's the Father, and this is heaven. Uh, here's the second heaven, that's the cosmos that you would travel from, first heaven, which is like our sky, through the second heaven, which is like the cosmos, to the third heaven, which is where God lives. Here's the second death down here. This is the blood of Jesus, you can see from the diagram. So, I came across this verse. For me, I, and again, I am... Guys argue about this for, for, for hours. You could sit in a coffee shop with a guy on the opposite side of the fence and go at this particular question and topic for hours and hours and at the end really not be getting closer to the destination. And I recognize that. So I came across this verse, though, that I feel like it unlocked the idea of how God chooses us before the foundation of the world. And this is in Romans. This is Romans 8, 29. And it says this, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, I agree with you that uh, to know someone, you have to know something about them. There, ne there needs to be some interaction between you and them. If, if you don't have some interaction, if you don't know some details that you didn't make up yourself, that's why I said a blind person, you wrote in their personality, and do you know them? Because some might say, well, God in his sovereignty created absolutely everything about you, including your choices. But I don't think that's true. I don't think you could know someone if you've decided everything without them. So we have this verse in Romans that says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. And I think about when I met Aaron when we were young, and yeah, I, I knew something about her. Okay, I was attracted to her. We had some, um, some conversations like I knew she was interested in missions, that kind of thing. Uh, she was feisty, I really liked that, her personality. And, and after knowing some things about her, I chose her to be my wife before she was ever my wife. Does that make sense? It's because I knew her that I was able to choose her. And I chose her before she ever became my wife. Now, what about good old Scott Frost? There he is in his office, choosing great players, hoping to resurrect our horrible college football reputation. Are you guys with me? Good times are ahead. Now, when he goes to choose his players, is it possible to choose a player that's going to be good for your team if you don't know anything about him? No, you've got to, like, check out the stats. Like, what's your attitude like? Like, here's my team. Are you interested in this kind of philosophy? I'm going to watch some film. Right? So before... You're ever a player on the team. This coach is learning about you, knowing you, and choosing you and picking you. You'll be a, a great player. You're, Scott will choose his players before they're ever players. Does that make sense? And the way he's going to choose them is he, he's going to know something about them. So let's go into mystery mode. I told you the book of Ephesians was 
Now, if you hear the word mystical, don't freak out. They call Tozer mystical. It just means mystery. You guys are okay with that, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's head into mystery mode. Here is the Father. It says, he chose, chose us in him. He chose us in Jesus. So there you are. You're in Jesus. We have these stick figures in here. You're in Jesus, and through some mystery, God actually knows you. Didn't he say about the prophet Jeremiah? What did he say about that guy? Famous verse out of chapter 1. Before I formed you, I knew you. I knew you before you were formed. And remember, um, remember Lucifer. Everything was fine for him in heaven until it was found in him that there was wickedness. Jesus found something that didn't belong inside of him, and he was booted from heaven. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, God tells us what he looks at in order to know us. What does he look at? How does he judge us? He looks at the heart. So we are in Jesus before we're ever made, but the mystery is that God knows us. Something about God's ability before the foundation of the world to actually know us. Now you might say, well, that kind of makes sense because he's all throughout time. He's everywhere in time. He, he, he knows like what we're going to do, what we're going to choose, what's going to happen in our life. So you might say, well, he can see it all from his vantage point here. He has a line of sight going everywhere, and he can kind of know you that way. But I propose to you that how, however it happens, that there is a moment before the foundation of the world where he knows you. And I don't know exactly how that's possible since you haven't done anything yet, but I do think that it is possible for him to do that. Something about God is able to know you in some kind of crazy, interactive way before you're even born. And I don't know how it would work, but he doesn't want robots. He didn't choose it for you. Something, it's like holding something in your hand and you, you know it. God holding the, the people in Jesus, the word, the one who speaks everything into existence. There you are, inside of Jesus, before you're even born. And the Father holds you, and he recognizes, and he sees, and he says, Oh, this is one of mine. This one, this one is going to love me back. This one is going to choose me. This one's going to live a life for me. You're predestined. Haven't been born yet. He can hold your soul in his hands, inside of Jesus, before the foundation of the world, and know that's one of mine. You should know that predestination, as far as I can tell and what I've read, is never applied to the lost. It never says the lost are predestined to be lost. So God is only applying this to his own family. It's only relevant to his own kids. Found in Jesus before the foundation of the world. In Romans, this word foreknew means to perceive, recognize, and know. So he foreknew you before the foundation of the world. He could recognize you. He could perceive and know you. And that gives him the ability to predestine you, which means to determine. So he can determine what he's got before you've even been born because he knows you. How are we doing, guys? Are you doing okay so far? Who said no? I was getting it. Oh, what do you got, Slave? You got questions? Yeah, I do. So you're saying that non believers were not predestined. Is that correct? I'm saying that the Bible never says that non believers are predestined to hell. It never says that. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. If you got, you've seen something I didn't see. Thank you, Mr. Klasen. Oh, boy. This used to happen when I taught JD in eighth grade science. No, this is a real point. Okay. Okay, so, so like the people who have found Jesus are like people.
people who have scholarships to go to UNL, to okay. the cross, and then people who are lost who are like walk-ons who have the opportunity to earn this. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> okay, if you didn't hear that. The believers are like those who have received scholarships to go play for Scott Frost. And the non-believers are like walk-ons who will then try out for the team and still go for it. And try to earn a scholarship. And try to earn a scholarship. Okay, one last question. Oh, <laughs> that, that earned you a, a clap. I'm proud of you, son. Okay. Yes. Yes. So God's like, hey, look at this one. They were a walk-on, and then they chose to do this, and then they entered the team, and then they gave them a scholarship predestined. Yes, Patty. But what does Pastor Keith say? More than one thing can be true at the same time. Yes, more than one thing can be true at the same time. I think you're dealing with the kingdom. The way I look at it is it's like a massive, like, diamond with a ton of different facets and you have to turn it to look at all the different sides of it. It's not one thing at one time and not the other things. So if you are a believer, you are predestined. God knew you before the foundation of the world. And then it says in 2 Peter, here's the father down here, it says, I'm not willing that anybody should perish. So here are those walking down the easy way. But here's my little staircase for repentance, which means to turn around and go in the opposite direction. Okay, so you're going through life. You get here. Here's the Holy Spirit drawing you. Uh, John 6, 44 says that the Father draws those who belong to him. So here he is. He's calling. He's drawing. We get to these floodwaters of Jesus. Um, this has helped me in my own understanding, this waterfall of Jesus' blood. If you walk under this massive cosmic waterfall of the blood of Jesus, can your sin survive? No. They can't make it. I think sometimes we think that our sins are actually more powerful than God's ability to forgive us. And that's why we feel bad about ourselves sometimes. But if you're underneath the waterfall, what does that hymn say? Sinners... Plunge beneath the flood. And lose. Yeah. Transgression, sins are gone. Sometimes we, we make mistakes, we blow it, and we think, I don't know if God can forgive that one. You're underneath the cosmic waterfall of God's blood. Don't dishonor the power of, God, of Jesus' blood by saying, I think my sins might be more powerful. What then? Should we sin all the more that his blood would be poured out all the more? No, because we become new creations. Our appetites are different now. We are looking into our destiny. We don't want it. Sin just doesn't appeal to us anymore. And the stuff that is in our life that is sin gets totally obliterated by Jesus' blood. It doesn't have a chance. Uh, all these stick figures here are supposed to be carrying crosses. And here's the Holy Spirit filling them up during our journey to be conformed to Jesus as we go from glory to glory. We carry our cross. Once we hit the cross, we carry our cross as we are in this process of being conformed to Jesus. Um, our appetites change, our life change, walking in the direction that God has for us to walk, and for us, death is a mere passing through this veil as we're transformed with a new body, the Father waiting for us in this third heaven, if, by the way, this is God's dream, to have his kids back. If God were to make a wish list, it would be, I want my kids back. Our inheritance is land, possession, mansions, to be together again, to be in God's presence, to see his glory, to talk to him face to face. God's inheritance is us. I think that's spectacular. So God knows us. Somehow he can 
He can hold our soul before the foundation of the world and know us, and that is how he can choose us before we are even born. Then we live a life that fully does all that he had seen that we would do, and we pass through the cross, we're drenched in the blood of Jesus, we're conformed to his son, we leave this body and we go home. That is the rough story. Now I want to take you back through some of these scriptures that we pass through, because I'm hoping that this understanding will illuminate a couple of things. Just as he chose us in him, the Father chose us in Jesus. You're in Jesus when he chose you, before the foundation of the world. This is verse 4. Because he knows that you're going to be holy and blameless before him in love. He can see the story. These guys are going to be holy and blameless. He predestined, which means he determined us to be, ad- to be adopted as sons, not to be slaves or, or soldiers. Not, that is not the ultimate uh, of who we are. We are sons and daughters. We are part of a family. Through Jesus Christ, there is no way to be a part of God's family unless you pass through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. And we throw around the world religions, and you can say whatever you want, but all of these leaders of all the religions of the world, they're all dead men. Ours is alive. And ours wasn't just a man. He is God. He was there before the foundation of the world. He didn't show up one day and have a great idea and grab some followers. He was there before the world was made. And one day we are all going to bow down before this one and no other one. To the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us, this is verse 6, in the beloved, that's Jesus. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. So way back here, in all of his wisdom, in all of his insight, he knows we are going to need a flood of Christ's blood, which he lavished upon us with super abundant amount. In all of his wisdom, in all of his insight that he had before the foundation of the world, knowing that we would need a flood of Jesus' blood to cover all of our transgressions before you even committed a single sin, or I did. Covered. Covered with abundant. Lavished upon us, verse 8. Verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable, and this is technical language here, guys, but just hang for a second, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is the summing up or the unifying of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things upon the earth in him. So administration is like, how do you get stuff done? Well, look, God's got a plan. God's got a way to administrate salvation for you and for me. With a view to an administration. So looking forward into how he's going to do it. How he's going to administrate the salvation of his own kids. Those that he has picked and predestined before the foundation of the world. Suitable to the fullness of the times. Everything being unified or summed up in Christ. All of heaven and earth is looking at God's administration on the earth going, whoa, this is what he's up to. So Jesus dies. His blood covers the sins of the world. He's the only one who could do it. Things in the heavens and things on the earth. Everything being unified and summed up in Jesus. Now, one day we will all see that with our eyes as we stand before the judgment throne and all angels and all demons and all powers and all people and all of everything summed up, unified, standing before Jesus and bowing their knee. He is Lord. Summed up in this, Jesus. 
administrated, pulled together in this, Jesus and his work. The floodwaters of his blood covering sinners and making them into saints. Verse 11, also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his own, of his will, meaning he wants to do these things to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, so this is talking about our responsibility, our choices to believe, you are sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. This Holy Spirit is proof that we belong to him who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. We have the Holy Spirit given to us as a pledge of our inheritance. So we're looking forward with a view to our inheritance. The Holy Spirit himself is presence in our lives, giving us this pledge that yes, the second death will not touch us, and we have an inheritance. Now wrap your mind around your inheritance just for a moment with me. When you die and you get to heaven, it won't be like, well, good job. Welcome to heaven. We're glad, you know, it didn't go the other way for you. And um, uh, good luck. You walk down the streets, don't know anyone. Where am I going to stay tonight? Yo, Scott. I stay at your place. I'm kind of new here. Right? You don't have to worry about that situation. Being kind of unknown, not having any place to stay. It's a new city. It's a new place. Everything's so glorious. No, everyone's going to know you, at least those people who have gone before, the great cloud of witnesses. You'll be escorted to your own house with your own land. Because you have an inheritance. And this is the way God made you, to have a house, to have land. And yes, Slava, God's houses are mountain ranges and uh, beautiful prairies and oceans and all that big stuff, too, is a house. Both of two things can be true at one time. You could be hosting people in your own house in heaven on your first day because that's your property. That's your inheritance. That is the way God made you. This Holy Spirit is a uh, pledge, a sort of proof, if you want, that all of this is your destiny and your future and where you're going with a view to this. Okay, where am I? Verse 15, I think. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which amidst which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. There's a lot to be thankful for. Apostle Paul's grateful. He's praying for these saints who are working out their salvation. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The glory of the Father's inheritance in the saints, that's you. So he prays that the eyes of your heart will be able to see all this. Now, I've created a goofy cartoon drawing in order to spark the eyes of your heart to look forward in time, to look deeper into the dimensions of, of God's kingdom so that you will say, there is glory in the saints which are God's inheritance. Something in you goes, I'm looking with the eyes of my heart and I see the glory that God will receive from his people. And that's me. The eyes of my heart are surveying the landscape of all God is doing throughout human history, even before that, before the foundation of the world. The eyes of my heart can imagine all of this. 
They can see my part in this story, and they can look forward to the inheritance that God has set aside for me and for the church. You are part of something much bigger than you. I am part of something much bigger than myself. This is the book of Ephesians, the book of cosmic, crazy realities that you have to use the eyes of your heart to see. And Paul is praying, I pray the eyes of your heart will start to see all this. Can you pass through the floodwaters of Christ's blood, which is lavished upon you, and still come out thinking you're a sinner without a future? Come on, that's why you're a saint, a holy one, set aside. With an inheritance. With a father who actually held you in his hands before the foundation of the world and said, I choose this one. And who's calling you to pray for people who don't yet know him, saying, come on, come on, come on. I'm not willing that any should perish. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. We're going to uh, take communion Communion is all about remembering. It's a moment to meditate and to think and to ponder what God has done for you. His blood that was poured out didn't drip a few drips and cover a few things. It was a flood that all sinners are invited to plunge beneath completely holy when they emerge. There's going to be two stations in the back. And what I want you to do when I release you is to go grab um, a piece of bread. You're going to dip it in the juice. I want you to return to your seat. And I want you to ask, as you remember what God did for you, I want you to ask God, do I live like I've been plunged beneath the floodwaters of Christ's blood and I've emerged? That inheritance that God himself is so much looking forward to enjoying completely one day. Do I think about going into free choice zone a little bit? Do I think about these lost who are just cruising on down? The second death is not anything that you want to experience, hopelessly lost in darkness. Do we think about our brothers and sisters who need to turn around and head to that same cross that made us into saints? Do we remember? Communion is all about remembering, celebrating, and being thankful for what God did for us. So I want you to take the elements. I want you to come back to your seat. I want you to have a moment or two thinking about your place in this great cosmic story. And what God is telling you now is you remember what he did. Remember this flood water is poured out for you. So I'll release you now, go back, grab the elements, sit in your seat, have a moment, and then we will pray and close. All right, Rachel, let's have you come up. Rachel has a word for us. She's going to share. I felt like the Lord was just encouraging me on my way here, just with this train of thought, that what you don't know, what things you don't know, get excited about. Don't get frustrated. Don't get scared. I don't understand. I don't know. Maybe I maybe I don't get it right. Or that's so confusing. The things in the Word of God, the things maybe we heard here today, it was just interesting that I've kind of wondered, like, do I understand right? Which which way of thinking is right? Which which way is wrong? And maybe I understand one fourth or one half of what Pastor Ken shared today. But instead of freaking out because maybe I don't understand perfectly. I felt Father saying, 
be in that wonder, be like a child. You don't know the story, you don't know the end, but I do, and it's good. It's good, it's good, it's good. So don't beat yourself up like, I don't know, I don't understand, what if I got it wrong? But instead have the, the posture of a child like, what God, really? Like, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. And so, um, just like your, your grandma knows you when you're little, the other thing that came into my heart was, my grandma tells me things I said when I was two, three, four, and I'm like, interesting, wow. <laughs> you're only 80, but you remember that? God knows us before we were born in Christ. And just kind of thinking about it, like how your, your grandma or your parents tell you, yeah, you said that. And you're like, Ooh, well, please don't tell anybody else. Um, we can trust God. His heart is like so full of love for us. So that's yeah. just my exhortation. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, so we can't know it all. We can't grasp it all. But we can stand in wonder. And today we're sending out the Atkins. Well, why do they need to go then? Why do we need to have missionaries then? Well, because God can see that they are going to go, that they are called to go, that they are going to touch people's lives. And those lives that are touched become a part of this family who is predestined. It has to happen. We have to pursue the lost. God can see what's in our hearts, and that has to be in our hearts. It is all part of a wonderfully big thing that's beyond something we can understand. Reaching the lost is, it has to be a part of our hearts even before we were ever born to go. So if you haven't taken the elements, take them with me. Lord, we bless these elements. We're thankful for what you've done for us. If you haven't taken the elements, uh, go ahead and take it now. Lord, we're thankful for your body, which was crushed for us. If it wasn't, we wouldn't have opportunity to go home and have a new body. Because your body was crushed, we get to have a resurrected one. Because of your blood, we are resurrected blameless. You also went the ultimate missionary on the ultimate mission. You went after the lost, that they might be the predestined sons and daughters of God. How does it all work? It is beyond our ability to know and comprehend. But our hearts are to pursue after those who don't know you, just like the heart of Jesus pursued and went. We're thankful for our own missions and what you've called us to do. So we say thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Bless us and keep us as we go, God. Shine your light and your face upon us that we would walk in your favor, that we would walk in your peace, that we would know you better today than yesterday and better tomorrow than today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Bless you guys. It's good to see you again. And we'll see you next time.